everyone knows that location is critical when selecting an investment property that's going to outperform. But what that sort of property is has changed since I've started investing. I'm going to explain how and what's going to be the sort of property that's in strong demand in the future. And then I'm going to show you how to become more productive in all areas of your life. Boy, that's going to be a valuable lesson in today's Michael Yardney podcast. Are you interested in property investing, success or money? Well, you're in the right place. This is the Michael Yardney Podcast, where each week you'll learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in 20 minutes or less. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property advice. Now here's your host, Michael Yardney, who has once again been voted Australia's leading property investment advisor. That's the fourth time he's won a similar award in the last six years. Everyone knows that location is critical when selecting an investment property that will outperform. But what makes a good location and why are some locations better prospects than others? Things have changed dramatically since I started investing well over 40 years ago. What makes a good location for a property today is very different to the type of property that I used to invest in before. So in today's show, I want to discuss what type of property is going to be in continuous strong demand in the future. Welcome to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, particularly to all the new listeners, and I know we're getting hundreds and hundreds every week, the iTunes statistics show that, and thank you so much for the established listeners who keep coming back and ranking us amongst the top business podcasts in Australia. It really makes me proud to be in that position. Also in today's show, we're going to discuss a mindset moment that was inspired by one of the most important lessons I learned from the late Jim Rowan. And then today, I'm going to give you some hints on being more productive in answer to a question from one of the listeners. Have a think about it. How big is your to-do list? If you're anything like me, it's probably huge. But I'm going to show you how I get so many things done. So if you need to get more efficient at your work, if you're not having enough time to get everything done, if you're struggling to find time... I'm going to show you some productivity hacks that should speed up your efficiency. We've got lots to cover in today's show. I look forward to hearing what you think about it. Why not leave a comment for me? Now, everyone knows that location is critical when selecting an investment-grade property one that's going to outperform. But what makes a good location and why are some locations more likely to be better capital growth prospects than others? That's what I want to discuss at the moment. As I started to think what I'm going to share with you, I realised that when I started investing around 40 years ago, the emphasis for home buyers was largely affordability and proximity to infrastructure. Now, many moved to the outer fringes of our capital cities, which were developed in the wake of those big new freeway extensions that occurred way back then, and commuting from those vast newly born suburbs into the CBD, that became commonplace. So what people looked for in amenities then, 40 or so years ago, was nearby shops, healthcare services, a school, and as well as, as long as they were all in relatively easy drive, and you could go to your employment reasonably quickly, life was pretty good. Now today, the property choices Australians make are still lifestyle-driven. But how we think and function in today's world has changed so much. You see, with more than half Australians having only one or two people in their households, more of us are choosing to start a family later in life, or we're enjoying the opportunity to work flexible hours or from home offices. Many of us are seeking a better work-life balance and prioritising downtime before overtime. Others of us are opting to live within walking distance from not only infrastructure, uh, but, but also from cafes, restaurants, recreation facilities, as lifestyle moves to the top of the owner-occupier and tenant wish list. Sure, affordability is important, but lifestyle is also important. And more of us are downsizing to easily maintain Um, our lifestyles in cost-effective apartments and townhouses with smaller gardens and smaller, more efficient, compact designs but in great locations. So what's going to create those locations, as I started to ask at the beginning, that are going to outperform the averages? And 
a lot of it's actually going to have to do with walkability um, because it's a new buzzword at the moment. Of course, proximity to amenities such as shops, parks, public transport that allows residents to either walk or take a short train or tram ride has long underpinned property values. In overseas countries, if you think about it, close to the subways and the tubes overseas, those locations have always outperformed. And now we're witnessing a similar trend in our more cosmopolitan Australia as well. In fact, it's common for a considerable premium to be paid for properties that are a short walk to the beach or to cafe strips. And long-term capital growth figures have shown that, let's take Sydney, for example, uh, Sydney's most walkable suburbs have outperformed averages by up to 20%. Yes, lifestyles become an undeniable fundamental force in today's real estate markets. Culturally, we're a nation that enjoys strolling to the local corner shop to catch up with friends or to pursue our leisure activities outdoors. It's not only suburbs close to the beach and pay the command premiums, but proximity to schools with good reputation is becoming a more of a must for family buyers. Some purchasers are paying extra to be within a particular school catchment zone so their children can easily walk, bus or train at the school. In fact, in my experience, Parents are prepared to spend more than half an hour extra to go to work if it means their children can walk safely to a special school, an esteemed school. Now, there's another trend that's important to understand as well in what's going to make a location special. And it should be no real surprise if you think about it, because with our busier lifestyles, how we're doing things is very different to how our parents and grandparents did things. Cafes... Restaurants have become a sort of transition point where we meet up with friends, with family, with business associates. That's where we just tend to catch up rather than entertaining at home. Now, many city dwellers have got their favourite haunts. Uh, they, they know the barista on a first-name basis. They've got a regular order. And the servings and consumption of coffees become somewhat of a ritual, as many of us fancy ourselves as coffee connoisseurs. Now, given that more of us are living alone or in smaller households, it's not surprising that the relaxed home away from home atmosphere of these inner city cafes is becoming an increasing a popular draw card. I remember when I first watched that TV show Friends in America years ago where people were sitting having coffee and catching up with friends at the restaurant. Well, Pam and my lifestyle has changed and um, we entertain much less at home and much more uh, uh, going out with friends to restaurants. Yeah, the cafe culture is king in Australia. And there's another trend you've got to understand, and that's walkability. As our population grows and our major cities increase in population, proximity, walkability to good amenities is going to become more and more important. If you think about it, Australia's population growth at 1.4, 1.5% per annum means that our population is going to grow by 7 8% in the next five years. But in some of our big capital cities, including Melbourne, the population is going to grow more than 10% in that time. And so it's important to find out how walkable a suburb is because as our population grows, the convenience to amenities, the walkability of a suburb is going to be more and more important. Now, interestingly, there's a site called walkscore.com.au, which uh, measures the walking distance of almost every property in Australia and measures the walkability of all suburbs. They've been ranked from zero, being very car dependent, to 100, most walkable. And the good news is that walkable neighbourhoods were recently recognised for the health and economic benefits, according to a study in the University of Melbourne. A 10-year study found good access to local infrastructure encouraged more people to ditch the drive and adopt health-enhancing behaviours. And if you're a property fan, as I guess you are because you're listening to my podcast, these cultural transformations that Australians are currently undergoing, they're important to recognise it signals then to the suburban McMansion fads in the outer suburbs and demonstrates just how crucial this demographic wave of change is going to be to planning and executing a successful long-term property portfolio. Sure, affordability is always going to be important, but lifestyle is a fundamental key to our property marketplaces today. 
If you understand the sort of property that's going to be in continuous strong demand in the future, that's going to underpin the success of your property portfolio. So understanding these demographic changes, I've just discussed how smaller households, walkability, proximity to the right sort of amenities is going to create a premium because there can only be so many of those locations. That's the sort of area that's going to outperform that's the sort of area you should be investing in. Now, I'm going to be back in just a moment after the short break with an important message that I learned from one of my early mentors, Jim Rowan, in my mindset moment. And then I'm going to share with you a heap of productivity hacks. People sometimes say to me, Michael, how do you write all those blogs and the books and do the podcasts and run a national company and still have good work-life balance? I'm going to share with you some productivity hacks to help your life become more balanced and more efficient in just a moment. Are you wondering who you can turn to for independent and unbiased advice? Metropole has helped beginning investors buy their first property. Experienced investors add to their portfolio and sophisticated investors manufacture capital growth by becoming property investors. The team at Metropole Property Strategists have been involved in over $2 billion worth of property transactions, creating wealth for their clients and they can do the same for you. It's a great feeling having the independent team at Metropole helping you formulate and implement your wealth building property investment strategy. Arrange a time for an obligation free chat at metropole.com.au. Today's mindset moment is inspired by the lessons I learned from the late Jim Rowan, who taught me that we generally change ourselves for one of two reasons, either inspiration or desperation. Now, I don't want you to have to change your circumstances because you've become desperate. So that's the reason we have these regular mindset moments, because I'm aiming for inspiration. I remember learning from my mentor, Jim Rowan, that if you want to become wealthy and happy, you've got to learn to work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And as I learned those things, I recognized that this business of personal development lasts a lifetime. You see, what you become is far more important than what you get. So the important question to ask yourself isn't, what am I getting? Instead, you should ask, what am I becoming? Getting and becoming are so closely intertwined, what you become directly influences what you get. Pay attention to that. Getting and becoming are so closely intertwined that what you become directly influences what you get. Look, think about it this way. Most of what you've got today, you've attracted to yourself by becoming the person you are right now. I've also found that income rarely exceeds personal development. Look, sometimes income takes a lucky jump. I see clients who've won uh, the lottery. I actually have. I've also seen lots more people who've inherited money or got a bonus or got a redundancy package. The problem is, unless you learn to handle the responsibility that comes with this, your money, the amount you've got, usually shrinks back to the amount you can handle. Now, I know some people say, no, that's not true. But I genuinely believe that if you took all the money in the world and divided it equally – Amongst everybody, it would soon be back into the same pockets as it was before. Do you agree with that? What that means is if somebody hands, suddenly hands you a million dollars, you better hurry up and become a millionaire in your mind, otherwise you're not going to know how to handle the money you've got. If suddenly you become successful in your business or your property investment, because the market's been kind to you, you better change to become the sort of person who can handle that sort of responsibility because it's hard to keep something that hasn't been obtained through personal development. So here's a great axiom in life from my late mentor, Jim Rohn. He said, to have more than you've got, you've got to become more than you are. So this is where you should focus your attention. Otherwise, you may just have to contend with his other axiom of not changing, which is, unless you change how you are, you're always going to have what you've got. So this personal development stuff I discuss every week is critical to your long-term success in money, in property, in business, in life in general, because the way you do one thing is the way you do everything.
I recently received an email from Irene from Westmead who asked, Michael, can you share with us how you can be so productive and get so much done? You seem to write all these blogs and podcasts and uh, books and run a company. So today I'm going to share with you 12 productivity hacks, things that I use to help make my life more efficient. People often ask me, how do I get so much done? And it is because I have learned how to work more effectively, how to choose things to do, how to focus my time on productive activities, and how to outsource or delegate other activities. So whether you're a property investor, a business person, an entrepreneur, I think these 12 productivity hacks will be helpful to you. You see, if you're like most of us, you're pulled in too many directions. So let's start with the first productivity hack. And the first one I'd be suggesting is start your day by asking yourself, what one thing could you do today that in 30 minutes or less would have the biggest impact on your life, whether it's your business, your job, your employment, your profession, your investment, whatever it is that you do. Then you've got to do that one thing before you do anything else. Now, you've got to be ruthlessly realistic about what you can get done in 30 minutes. So there'll be time when you do bigger duties. I'll explain that in a moment. But chunk down a larger project into that one thing that you could bite off and get done in just 30 minutes of focused time. The next productivity hack I'd like to share with you is, I guess, a follow-on from that. Where I'm going to suggest you set aside one half-day chunk of time each week, what I call focus time, to work on high-value activities. To create value, you need to block off time. Yet, if you're a business owner, your time is increasingly fractured by smaller and smaller units. So you've got to pick one day a week that you're going to carve out four hours to work on your highest value work. I do that. I work from home every Wednesday where I don't have interruptions. I have my email off for most of the day. And for half the day, I do these podcasts. I write my blogs. I write my articles. Actually, the second half of the day, I spend with my kids and my grandkids. And that's really important value time for me as well. But my suggestion is find a four-hour block to work on your highest value activity. Then turn off your emails, close your door. Perhaps you leave the office. Perhaps you work from a remote location and work on high value activities. The third productivity hack I'd like to share with you, I learned from Brian Tracy when he wrote that book, Eat That Frog. And he's he was saying basically, do the, the, the hardest task of the day first and anything after eating a frog starts to taste good. So rather than wasting all your emotional energy dreading this item, this nasty thing that you've got to do, each day ask yourself, what is my most feared thing on my to-do list today? And then get it done, right then, right there. It'll free up an immense amount of energy for you to invest in other activities. The fourth productivity hack I'd like to share with you is to narrow your focus to those fewer, better things that are going to truly make a difference. Most successful business people know that fewer is better. So remember, you've got a limited amount of attention units, so invest them wisely. So right now, focus on executing extremely well, I don't know, one or two things rather than skimming over 10 things. Half done is much more expensive than not done at all. If the task matters, take it to completion before moving to the next item. One of the big things that changed what I was able to do many, many years ago is when I hired a personal assistant. And I'm going to suggest you do that as well. But many people are scared of hiring a personal assistant because they wonder, how much work can I pass on to them? Now, if you're an employee, this isn't going to work for you. But if you're a business person, an entrepreneur, consider getting a personal assistant. And nowadays, there are virtual assistants that you can pay, I don't know, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 a year for and have a full-time one, not just part-time. You can get part-time as well, but a full-time one who's going to work specifically for you. And you could get them to do things like uh, make your appointments, scan your email, scan files, uh, set up an e-filing system, update your blog, schedule meetings, screen your inbox, um, handle billing issues, troubleshoot computer fixes, all sorts of things, things that you could give away, delegate, so that you could spend your time doing more valuable things. The sixth productivity hack is to hire out other people, not necessarily a personal assistant, who you can pay to do tasks that are worth, I don't know, less than $20, $25 an hour. And that will allow you to spend time getting the results you want. And I know a lot of people who have cleaning ladies, are cleaning people in their houses, uh, uh, get other people to do their ironing, 
for them. I remember a number of years ago, a friend of mine said, oh, I've got to uh, go out to the garden and get my lawnmower. And I said, yeah, I have a lawnmower too. His name's Kevin. Um, and uh, <laughs> I sort of said it jokingly, but it's true. I don't waste my time on $20 an hour jobs uh, mowing the lawn or doing the garden when I could be using my time more productively. The seventh productivity hack I'd like to share with you is the concept of how to use your emails and not respond straight away. And sometimes just leave it for a while and aid your emails. And if it's not urgent and hasn't happened and nothing's gone wrong, sometimes just don't act on them. Remember, the faster you respond to your emails, the more likely you're going to be keeping getting emails from other people. Another email hack is to avoid using your inbox as your to-do list. Sure, email is a great tool to share information and dash off quick notes to people, but it makes a lousy task manager. So use a list or a program specifically designed as a, as a task manager, not emails uh, to manage your to-do list. A good one is a program called Todoist, not to-do list, but Todoist that you can get um, for free on the internet and you can download it on your smartphone as well. Another productivity hack if you're in business or a professional is to schedule, and if, and if you've got lots of appointments that you've got to schedule all the time, get a program that does that. Schedule once is one of them, uh, Calendly is another. So what that will do is help you and your clients, your patients, uh, your customers share appointments with you. Another productivity hack that I've use is having multiple email signatures and the email signature actually has attached to it a whole lot of common paragraphs so if I've got to shoot off the same thing over and over again you either attach it as a signature with, with the paragraphs above it so you don't have to keep writing it you know for recurring types of emails that you do or in Outlook there's uh, uh, an insert section where you can actually insert chunks of uh, paragraphs, uh, common paragraphs or things that you do, so you don't have to write them out over and over again. The second last productivity hack I'd like to share with you today is, if you're in business, you'd know, if you're self-employed, you know, there are recurring fires that you regularly have to deal with and solve. So create a systematic way of solving them, but permanently. Either do this by getting to the root cause of these issues, these fires that keep coming, or by delegating the problem to a team member that you can train and empower to handle them. Remember, prevention is almost always better than treatment. Now, I've gone through a whole lot of what I'm calling productivity hacks with you, but today there's one more. And the last one is grow your capacity to tolerate leaving lower value tasks undone. Some things just don't matter. So as you build up your to-do lists, you should also build up a to-don't list, things that you've got to stop doing so that you've got time to do the more things. So what's your compulsion to check that box on your to-do list that you've done all those items? What's it costing you in terms of wasted tasks? So in my mind, one of the best ways to get more done is to choose not to do more. Well, there you have it. 12 productivity hacks that helped me. And thank you for your question, Irene, because it allowed me to have this little bit of a rant about things I've learned over the years to make my life more productive. I hope you can use a couple of those to make your life more productive too. Well, thanks for listening to another show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did putting it together for you. Before we go, I'd like to share two reviews I've received recently on iTunes. If you put a review on iTunes, First of all, I want to read it out, but secondly, I want to say thank you by giving you a gift of one of my books. So if you're one of these two people who I'm reading out the review now, send me an email with your details and I'll send you a book. The first one was Raju Katari, who said, I love the podcast, empowering every listener with mindset moments. I'm glad you enjoy them. Raju, look forward to hearing from you and giving you your gift. And Mitch McGuinness said, outstanding, love the information Keep up the great work, Michael. So, Mitch, also look forward to hearing from you and giving you your gift. Why don't you go to Michael Yardney podcast backslash review or go to iTunes and just leave a review? That's your way of saying thank you to me. And I'd also really appreciate it if you could tell a couple more people about the podcast. I'm having lots of fun putting them together. Clearly, lots of people are getting value from it because our listenership keeps going up and up, but it inspires me. It's my way of getting some thanks if you pass the message on. Look forward to having a chat with you again this time next week. 
Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect, and pass on their wealth through strategic property advice. If you got value from listening to this podcast, please leave us a review and we'll read it out on a future show. Just go to michaelyardneypodcast.com forward slash review and it will take you over to iTunes where you can enter a review and let us know what you think. We'd really appreciate it. If you don't already subscribe on iTunes or on your Android phone, you'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast. If you'd like to gain instant access to the show notes or a transcript of the show, head across to michaelyardneypodcast.com. Watch out for our show next week. You learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 20 minutes.